to the final event of the Let's Talk About Palestine series, um, which is a serious series that has been such a, an important public forum for us here at the university, for all of us as an intellectual community to come together to think and reflect about Palestinian, Palestinian history, uh, politics, the war on Gaza, uh, on Palestinian literature today. Uh, so in that sense, I would like to thank the organizers of this series, um, for you know our colleagues from uh, the Department of Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures for such an important work in making this possible for us. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Ojib Ben Hamad. I'm an assistant professor of comparative literature of Arabic and comparative literature, um, and today um, I'm very honored to moderate this conversation between my uh, esteemed colleagues, uh, Ahmed Dia and Stefania Gondolfo, on the question of Palestinian literature and the writing of trauma. Um, so uh, the plan today is you know, for both of our speakers uh, to give us uh, our, their lectures, and Professor Dia will go first. After that, um, I will be, you know, engaging with my colleagues in, in you know, some remarks, reflections, and questions, and then uh, we'll open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. Okay. So, but let me first introduce uh, my colleagues. Uh, so first, uh, we'll listen to a talk by Professor Ahmed Diab. He's assistant professor of modern Arabic literature and Middle Eastern cinema at UC Berkeley. Uh, he specializes in the politics of culture and representation in the Eastern Mediterranean and, Palestine, and in Palestine, on Palestinian art and intellectual production. His book entitled Intimate Others, Arabs through, Palestine, through, Arabs through the Palestinian Gates is forthcoming with Stanford University Press and is the first study of its kind to explore how Palestinians represent non-Palestinian Arabs in literature and visual culture. Professor Diaz's other research interests include Arab, exilic, and historic literatures, as well as the theory and practice of translation. And he has produced a number of very important, important translations of Mahmoud Darwish, uh, by the Syrian poet to Mohammed al Mahmoud. Alongside his academic writings, Professor Diaz publishes creative fiction and poetry in both Arabic and English. Okay? So, Professor Diaz will be our first speaker for today. Um, and, uh, and then we'll uh, um, you know, listen to the lecture by Professor Stefania Pondolfo, who is a professor of anthropology at Berkeley. Uh, her work centers questions of subjectivity, postcolonialism, and trauma in the Maghreb and puts in conversation critical theory, psychoanalysis, and Islamic intellectual traditions. She has published extensively on Maghrebian modernity debates post-colonial narratives of selfhood, and intercultural approaches to the issues of madness and mental illness. These diverse and critical interests are perhaps best reflected in her latest book, Not of the, Not of the Soul, Madness, Psychoanalysis, and Islam, published by the University of Chicago Press, which is both, and the book is both an anthropological study and a deep critical reflection on the experiences of social and political violence in Morocco, the post-colonial institution of psychiatry and Islamic practices of healing. Uh, Professor Pondolfo is currently working on a book on uh, the aesthetic experience at the clinic, and which will be titled Art Cure. Thank you all, and uh, please, uh, we'll first have Professor Diab for the first lecture, so help, help me welcome Professor Diab. Thank you very much, Rajdi. Um, thank you for my colleagues, the organizers, Nora, Adam, Rita. Um, thank you uh, for coming today. I, to the, my talk is entitled, In Amina's Words, Language and Genocide in Gaza. On the southern edge of Doha, Qatar, and a mere 10-minute drive from its international airport, 
lies at the manor, a modern and isolated residential complex with whitewashed walls that stretches along a city park. Over the last four months, a Thumama complex became the temporary home of a steadily increasing number of evacuees from Gaza. A weekly plane load of the recently maimed lands at DOH. Of course, it could have departed from GZA, for those who remember. In most cases, they come in pairs. One wounded person and one family caregiver. I recently facilitated a group writing therapy workshop with some of the Palestinian teenagers residing at Thumam. On our very first session, Amina, a 16-year-old young woman, who had arrived in Doha as a caregiver for her wounded mother and sister three months prior, came ready with a notebook and four pages narrating the worst dawn of her life. If I may, and with her permission, I'd like to start by reading an excerpt from what she wrote. سأروي لكم اليوم عن أحداث اليوم السيء الذي مررنا به هذا اليوم المشؤوم هذا اليوم يمر على كل مواطن فلسطيني يعيش في غزة الحبيبة كنا نحن جالسين في غرفة العائلة ونتحدث عن الحرب وعن ماذا سيحل بنا ونروي القصص والحكايات لبعضنا البعض ونضحك ومن ثم تناولنا طعام العشاء وبقينا جالسين إلى أن ذهب كل منا إلى النوم في غرفته وبقينا نائمين بسلام حتى الساعة السادسة فجرا هذه الساعة المشؤومة أنا كنت نائمة في فراشي وأبي وأمي في غرفتهما والدي صلى الفجر ومن ثم رجع إلى الفراش وأمي جالسة على كرسي صلاتها لأنها لم تنتهي من الصلاة وأختي المتزوجة وأولادها الاثنين نائمين بسلام في غرفة أخي بينما أخي كان نائما في الغرفة الخارجية لمنزلنا وأختي الثانية كانت في نفس الغرفة التي كنت فيها صلت الفجر وسمعت أصوات القصف وخرجت إلى غرفة المعيشة المضلة على حديقة منزلها فدخلنا فدخلت لها شرية من باب المنزل اخترقت الباب الحديد وفاتت بقدمها وقطعت الشريان الرئيسي الذي يضخ الدم ومن ثم سقطت أرضا ودمها ملأ المكان ومن ثم صرخت وأمي وهي جالسة على كرسي صلاتها فاتت لها شظايا من السقف حيث فاتت بعينها شظية أدت إلى انفجار العين وخمسة شظايا في قدمها وكسر أيضا وأخي خرج من الغرفة التي كان بها وهو قادم إلى الحمام ليتوضأ ليصلي الفجر فاتت شظايا من حط من حائط المنزل واخترقت يداه وقدماه وأيضا كف يده الذي كان يحمل به الجوال الذي فاتت به شرية حمت يد أخي من البتر الحمد لله بعد كل هذه الأحداث التي مرت بها كل أفراد عائلتي أختي المتزوجة وأطفالها استيقظوا من النوم على أصوات القصف العالية جدا هذه الأصوات إلى الآن تدور في ذهن أنا لا أنسى هذا اليوم السيء المعتم قمت من النوم وأختي الثانية وأخي وأمي الذين يصرخون من الخوف والألم كل هذا شاهدته صحيت في هذا الوقت وليتني لم أصحو 
فتحت عيناي لأجد غرفتي كلها رملا وحجارا وضباب لا أرى أي شيء في الغرفة حتى باب الغرفة لا أراه لكي أخرج كنت على سريري مغطاة ببطانية ثقيلة هذه البطانية امتلأت شظايا أجل لقد حملتني البطانية أحسست بشيء سخن يحرقني في قدمي ثم قمت من سريري ورميت البطانية بقوة لأبعدها عني ومن ثم صرخت صرخة بصوت عال مليء بالخوف هذا الصوت الذي لن أنساه طوال حياتي وقد ذكرت حينها بأن أبي وعائلتي قد هربوا ونسوني فبدأت أصرخ حينها أبي أبي أنا هنا أبي أبي أنا هنا أبي أرجوك لا تتركني وتذهب فنادى علي بصوت عال كان خائفا عن ماذا حصل بي قال نحن هنا متجمعون في هذه الغرفة هيا اخرجي بسرعة Amina's words which I'm choosing to leave untranslated puts us before an immediate question What can language do at a time of active, ongoing genocide. What does bearing witness achieve if, it does, if it's not going to put a stop to the violence being committed? Can the act of describing the horror amount to anything more? A series of larger and broader questions follow. What does art do? What does literature actually do at a time of industrial scale violence? Aminur's words leave me with personal questions as well. What is the role of the academic, Palestinian academic, in a public American institution during a time of a genocide enabled by the US government? What is the role of the Palestinian academic teaching at an institution that continues to deny the massacres, the suffering, the mere naming of the perpetrators? In some ways, the answer is speaking truth to power. But that answer has become cliché, peddled by leftists and left-leaning intellectuals and academics in the whole ways of liberal institutions, at least for the past two decades. This worn-out slogan has now all of a sudden accrued unprecedented weight that comes with the full severity of the law. Does that mean that language matters? Does it mean that there is work for language to do during an ongoing atrocity? Are these even the proper questions? Or is it a different category altogether? It is true that no language, no singular work of art can stop a massacre. But then again, nothing else is. And furthermore, in so many ways, the war of Palestinians has always been a war of language, a war of propaganda, a war of PR. I do not claim that I, I am bringing answers, and uh, personally, I am finding my answers elsewhere, not in the US, and not necessarily in the confines of an academic setting. But I am here to speak to you as an academic in this academic institution. I hope that whatever I have to share with you would be an invitation to ponder the Palestinian condition in the present moment and is often missing or occluded proper context. And to ask some of these difficult questions about the status, utility, and role of literature, culture, precisely language, during an ongoing genocide. I 
I would argue that modern Palestinian culture, be it visual or textual, is but one massive archive of texts that bear witness to various acts of erasure, annihilation, obliteration, that are committed by Zionism. If Palestinian culture is the appropriate expression of Palestinian presence, then we must contend with the fact that Zionism forces an interpretation of that presence. Whether in the, uh, that interpretation is always attempting to overpower, to erase, or at least curtail that presence. Whether in the looting of thousands of books from the private libraries of Palestinians in 1948, or in the destruction of all 11 universities in Gaza during the ongoing genocide of 2023-2024, Zionism seeks to vacate Palestinians' presence of any intelligible coherence, whether it's to Palestinians themselves or to those who come into contact with them. Despite occasional lapses into opportunism and subpar writing, I contend that Palestinian authors in Gaza, which is one of the answers I'm finding, uplift them, present some of the voices that have stood up to erasure and forces of annihilation in Gaza. That's one of the answers I'm proposing uh, as a proper use of language here in the U.S. on the Ohlone territory. I would contend that authors in Gaza, in Gaza with their penning novels, plays, poetry, or history, embark on a profoundly heroic venture. Their pursuit of self-definition, definition, relentless autodidactic struggle, stands unparalleled since the tumultuous events of the Palestine War of 1948, as it is known in Arab epistemology and historiography. If you consider the host of historical, psychological, and aesthetic factors that they had to engage with and contend with, the modern history of the Gaza Strip since 1948 is deeply intertwined with the broader struggle for self-determination and liberation across the global south. Following the Arab Israeli war, Egypt initially administered Gaza with its people, but its people continued to resist Israeli occupation and assert their Palestinian identity. This is only possible to us today in 2024 because there were poets who wrote as early as the late 40s and as late, early as the early 50s of the life of the refugee, the Palestinian refugee. This repertoire is one of the reasons that we're able to speak of a Palestinian culture. Because for a long time, the complete eradication of the Palestinian people was considered fit a complete. <coughs> one such voice is Harun Hashim Rashid, a Gaza native, born in 1927, died in 2020. Is one of the earliest and most expressive. He penned some of the earliest and most expressive explorations of alienation amongst uprooted and dispossessed Palestinians after the Nakba. A Gaza native, Rashid bore witness to the demolition of homes by the British soldiers during his childhood, a traumatic event that he kept back, kept going back to in his poetry, and and long-standing colonial practice upheld until this very day by the subsequent colonial power ruling over Palestine, the Israeli state. After obtaining a higher teacher training diploma from Gaza College, he worked as a teacher until 1954. And 1954 is the year he published one of his, uh, uh, his debut uh, D1 poetry collection. With strangers. And perhaps today,
some of some of the poet, some of his poetry uh, might train as as sappy, sentimental, uh, replete with with self pity. Uh, also, uh, it echoes uh, a gender Arab, non Palestinian Arab view of the Palestinian refugee. If you read the poetry and watch the films on the subject at the time, the Palestinian is often a hapless woman refugee uh, in search of, a, of a, an Arab male savior. Um, so, in some of his poetry, we find echoes of this. Uh, Ma'al-Ghurabat, the titular, titular poem, for example, um, is narrated in the voice of a little Palestinian girl addressing her father, لماذا نحن يا أبتي لماذا نحن أغراب أما لنا في كل هذا الكون أصحاب At the same time, the cover on uh, the collection is also uh, the creation of one of the most prolific and celebrated Palestinian uh, painters, Ismail Shamut. Um, this is the original. Um, Ismail Shamut, a native of Lidda, was uh, rendered a refugee, and uh, he sought refuge in Gaza in the early 40s, the late 40s, early 50s. He would go on to study. <coughs> Uh, in Rome and spent time in Egypt uh, and he is one of the most celebrated Palestinian artists along with his uh, artist wife uh, uh, Imam al, -Akhad, Imam al So as early as uh, these are these these uh, Smaish Shamut's uh, paintings of the period uh, mostly tell his experience of dispossession of exile uh, he's uh, a contemporary of uh, Harun, ha Harun Hashim Rashid. Another Gazan uh, is uh, credited with also creating this archive for the Palestinian dispossession that occurred in, in Gaza and also at the uh, maltreatment of uh, Arab regimes of, of uh, certain rebellious Palestinian activists. Uh, and I'm speaking of uh, Maim Siso. Uh, Maim Siso, born in 1926, similarly experienced multiple dislocations throughout his tumultuous life. Uh, a Marxist revolutionary, he bridged the space between being the poet and the activist in pursuit of freedom and liberation. His literary journey began, began, began with the publication of his first poems in Jaffa Lake based magazine Al Liberty, in 1946. He led multiple uh, um, activist, rebellious uh, actions against uh, the Egyptian authorities at times when they moved to Gaza and they prevented uh, Palestinians from returning to their ancestral homes or engaging with the Israeli uh, colonial forces. Um, he continued to explore themes of national liberation, democracy, social progress through his essential poetry. And despite spending a total of seven years in various prisons due to his commitment to the Palestinian cause, he persisted in his artistic endeavors and in his belief in, um, in the in the, in the loud 60s and 70s mode of expression. His works are also translated into multiple languages, including English, French, German, and Russian. He was himself a translator of uh, Russian into Arabic. Um, of course, he, he would pass away in the, in the most uh, exilic Palestinian uh, possible way. Uh, he passed away in a hotel room in London. His body would only be found days later uh, because he had the Don't Disturb sign on. And um, in 1967, Israel's occupation of Gaza.
Gaza further fueled Palestinian resistance, drawing global attention to the plight of those living under military rule. The subsequent decades saw grassroots movements like the first, the first Intifada of 1987 that sprang from the refugee camp of Jabalia, where Palestinians courageously rose up against the Israeli colonial rule and demanded an end to the occupation. And it is within this occluded, uh, deliberately excised context, resistance movements such as Hamas and others that uh, came into existence as an expression of the frustration, uh, as an expression of the infinitely ghettoized uh, colonial reality uh, forced upon them in the confines of the Gaza Strip. Increasingly, and alongside poetry, since the Oslo Accords allowed the return of various Palestinians from the Shatat, uh, which, um, unlike other uh, people, reluctant to easily translate into diaspora, um, from the Palestinian Shatat, poetry gave way to more prose and prose fiction. And Gaza became an exporter of short stories, as one short story introduction introduction to a short story collection for writers from Gaza had it. Uh, Gaza became an exporter of, one of the biggest exporters of orange and short stories. Um, so, in reading the rich corpus of work, works published by authors from Gaza in the last 15 years, one might detect what uh, I'm calling uh, a Gaza sensibility, which is uh, quite distinct from, say, um, the writings of uh, Arabs and uh, uh, Palestinians in the Arab Shatat, or the writings of Palestinians in the Galilee that live with, under the uh, confines and restrictions of Israeli uh, citizenship. Uh, you don't find the dark humor that tries to reconcile the banality of being Palestinian in Israel and the writings of people who write in Gaza and from Gaza. Um, this Gaza sensibility is firmly grounded in the details of the local coffee shops, the narrow alleyways of uh, 18 official and unofficial camps, refugee camps of Gaza. That sensibility favors direct, terse, even austere diction with a meditative bent towards considering a singular event or a central scene. And the centrality of the scene in, in prose fiction is uh, uh, an observation the late Edward Said made uh, in one of his articles. Um, the scene, according to him, becomes the one of the, if not the only one, of the few possible spaces for the Palestinian writer uh, to uh, try to make sense of the fragmentation uh, under which she lives. Um, and under which she has to write. One of the best examples of this trend, in my opinion anyway, uh, is Nehruz Ney Kharmut. Nehruz was born in uh, Yarmouk refugee camp in Damascus in 1984. She's an award-winning writer, journalist, and a women's rights advocate. And uh, her time outside of Gaza uh, is quite formative, uh, that transformation into from, from a Palestinian of the Shatat into a Palestinian in Palestine, but in a specific, very specific part of Palestine, um, produced a host of contradictions for her. And um, in her writing, she tries to address squarely these contradictions. Um, her short story collection, the cloak of the sea, or the sea cloak rather, and the braid, the sea cloak and the braid, two different, two different stories in the short story collection. They provide invaluable insights into Gaza challenges, into Gaza's challenges, with a particular focus on women's concerns in the ghettoized reality of Gaza. Um, her work delves into the human conflict, historical struggles, and the, quest, and the quest for safety, liberty, and dignity. The titular story, for example, of this collection, uh, Abat al-Bahr, the sea cloak, offers a poignant and unflinching representation of a simple family day 
by the beach and how the uh, teenager woman protagonist tries to enter the water fully clothed, almost drowns, gets saved by a gazan uh, teenager with her brother watching from afar. Um, it's uh, uh, all told in a very direct yet uh, sensitive uh, diction and, uh, uh, and tone. Uh, she's, uh, some, some uh, critics have compared her uh, vignettes to those of Mahfouz, of, of Cairo life. Um, so, I think, you know, since October 7th, scores of, if we jump to the present moment, um, there will be many, many, many stories that will be forever left untold because their authors are no longer with us. Um, Omar Abu Shawish, Abdul Karim Hashash, Inas al Sakha, Jihad al Masri, Shahad al Bahlahan, Nur al Din Hajjaj, Mustafa al Sawab, many, many more. The conservatives' total toll stands at 33,000 people killed, 8,000 more unaccounted for, still under the rubble. And some 70,000 people wounded and maimed. In a, in a sort of, in the macabre math of genocide, I, I, I started thinking, what, what is lost? Can it be quantifiable? It would take a good short story writer maybe a week to conceive of a story and write it. <coughs> We're talking about 100,000 lives altered, lost, ended. How many weeks would it take for how many writers to imagine all these altered lives, all these ended life? Um, I, as I said in the beginning, I found some of my answers elsewhere, not in the US, not necessarily in, in academia. Uh, and in a Fumano complex, the number of evacuees uh, that arrive keep increasing, and there will be a lot of work to be done in archiving their stories and making sure their stories are uh, remembered, are written, uh, and they're making sure that their traumas are uh, not left um, unaddressed. I, it's already getting hot for them in April in Doha. Uh, they, they await uh, the strong sun of the Gulf that ended the lives of the men in the sun inside that tank in the late 50s, according to the logic of the, that novella. Um, it is uh, uncannily puzzling for, for any Palestinian, especially someone who's uh, worked on, on Palestinian culture, to think that the question, what if, is, 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 is happening? What if the Nakba happens in your life when you're uh, potentially, ostensibly uh, uh, ready, prepared, strong, um, and yet everybody I talk to who is able to do anything is uh, full of shame that we cannot stop at least what's happening. And, um, you know, the, the, the story of Palestinians in Gaza is a story of uh, infinitely inspiring resilience. 
uh, I started with the story of Amina, and Amina is, is very loud. Uh, uh, she's impossible to uh, pin down to a chair, to uh, get her to, to do anything other than what she decides she wants to do. Uh, and it's usually a, a match between Amina and Ibrahim in the workshop that I facilitate. Ibrahim is 20 years old. He is maimed, he is not a caregiver. And his only surviving limb is his left arm with three fingers. And he is full of words. He does not want to uh, stay silent. He is very expressive. And he, whenever I'm in his presence, I see that he's turned his remaining three fingers into fountains of life. And I'm, uh, I remember my first time going, I thought, okay, uh, what, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not ready for the traumatic stories, but a writing workshop, what, what, what can be unexpected? And then I met Brahim, and he only has three fingers and he cannot use a pen. And I was, uh, you know, I found, it, I found it an awkward problem to try to, to solve. And it turns out he has already solved it. He told me, I will write you a story next week, and I will write it on my phone. And he did. And the following week, he wrote me another story with his surviving three fingers. Mind you, Ethamama is, while it's, it's a very, uh, as far as these things go, I mean, it's, it's a, an okay accommodation, but it doesn't have ramps. Ibrahim makes sure that he leaves his building, come on his wheelchair, aided by whoever is, is nearby, uh, gets up the stairs and down the stairs with the help of volunteers, because we still don't have ramps. So it's, it's um, I, I think, it's important to, to remember the, the resilience of Gazans, Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, and, you know, if, if this genocide is taken to its logical end, um, we will have one type of Palestinian experience, and that's a concern to me, and that would be of the Shatat. We will not have Palestinians writing in Palestine about Palestine in Arabic. I think the, uh, the, the Zionist insistence on, on uh, erasing Palestinians once and for all is, is no longer possible. But it is still possible to reduce and uh, to reduce the Palestinian experience to an exilic experience that can only occur outside of our ancestral homes, outside of Palestine. And that's a real threat of what's happening right now uh, from a um, perspective of, of people who care about culture and language and preservation of, of uh, unique ways of, of expressing uh, one's self and one's relationship with their ancestral homes. Um, I would like to think that Amina's words are in conversation with some of the murmurs of the ghosts that are still with us in these hallways of the Ololi people. I uh, don't do uh, that uh, formative Berkeley uh, email signature, but as a displaced Palestinian, I very much honor their souls and their goals. And um, I, I hope that Amina's words are, are understood by the rest of the Olomi people. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, thank you, Ahmed, for such a powerful, personal, and deeply insightful uh, presentation. Um, I have some questions and reflections that I will share with you after the second uh, lecture. Um, and now we go to our second uh, talk for the evening by Professor Stefania Pondorfo. So please help, you know, join me welcoming her for the talk. Thank you. Actually, after listening to Ahmed speaking, I feel like addressing what he said rather than leaving my talk. Um, at some level, my talk is related to we didn't talk to each other and we come from very different places and experiences, at least theoretically related to some of the things that he said. And um, so, but I, I will have to read my talk. So maybe we can keep the discussion for later. But I wanted to say how much I appreciate it. Um, your, your, your courage to actually um, not to speak of give up your hope. And, uh, and also your courage in, in, in thinking about the importance of, of language and writing and, uh, and what can keep uh, a culture alive that might be possibly transmitted and what does it mean to a eradicated culture. And I appreciated so much what you said about the dark humor and, uh, and the willingness to look into an apocalyptic moment in an apocalyptic way. So, um, so my talk is called uh, open our eyes. As I speak about trauma in Palestine, as someone who is here in Berkeley, now not there, even though, one second. As a person who is here in Berkeley, not there, even though here, as we were reminded yesterday, Tax day, it's April 15th. There were protests on the freeways and on the bridges uh, because this is an American war. And here is deeply entangled, was there. And uh, as I speak to someone who's not Palestinian and does not usually write about Palestine, but I write about Morocco. Uh, where Gaza is nonetheless felt as a knot in the stomach, and where Palestine has been on everyone's mind for the last several decades. I must first of all acknowledge my incapacity, my own, an incapacity, my own, and an inadequacy, that of the word trauma, to grasp what for the last six weeks, six months, I'm sorry, six and a half months, and for the last 75 years has been the attempt at the obliteration of a people, of a place, and a form of life. For trauma, in the everyday sense that we use, not in the list of words associated to trauma that we did in my class that actually exceeded the everyday sense of trauma, and some of my students are here, and I thank them for that. But trauma in its everyday sense, as we read in the book Empire of Trauma, and in its application to the sites of humanitarian disaster, has been normalized to become one of the experiential and institutional frames through which we do not see. 193 days of relentless bombing. Every day we wake up to the announcement of the number of the counted newly dead, and many more uncounted until the rubble in that housing complex, in that neighborhood of refugee camp, in the hospital, in that market. In Gaza, where every hospital and school and church and mosque and university has been bombed, and for the most part destroyed, where people have been forced to evacuate to then be bombed again as they move to find precarious shelter and are struck again. Where the survivors are deprived of food, water and medicine and are facing starvation, 
and where every living person knows that they, they may be tomorrow's dead, where every utterance and every photograph is text testamentary, aware that they may be the one's last word and one's last family portrait, where there is no end in sight other than what appears to be the end itself. And yet, despite it all, the signs of insistent life, a desire for living, a young man's open smile today on Al Jazeera as he shows to the journalist the bag of bread that he was able to procure after many hours of waiting in line. Or the artist who makes puppets with empty hands for children to play. With the felt incapacity and the inadequacy of concepts comes a sense of urgency manifesting itself as a knock in the stomach, also mine. To speak about trauma in Palestine today, we must, bear, we, we must be able to bear witness to the dead. And as we speak about Gaza on this campus, in this room, in our classes, we must visualize that we are evoking a place where every classroom and every school, every library and every book are in the process of being destroyed. And in the large number of school children and students, teachers, writers, and poets, as Ahmed was actually naming, have been killed. The Palestinian poet Musab Abu Toha was in Gaza until he was detained and tortured by the Israeli army while evacuating with his family from Gaza City to Khan Hamis in the south. At the beginning of the war on Gaza, he had published a powerful essay, The View from My Window in Gaza, that my students also read this semester, where he narrated in an intimate mode how he returned to his apartment after a bombing to get some food left in the refrigerator and he meditated by his library on the lives gone in his deserted neighborhood. From Cairo, where he is now, he posts daily updates on social media, which he comments in laconic sentences, sometimes short poems. Quote, I look at my city, it lies in ruins. I imagine the heap of concrete as puzzle pieces, but they are disfigured, and there is no place for me to sit down and reassemble them. April 11. Quote, the breaking news about our death and our wounds and the decimation of our lives has become so familiar that is not stopping even for a minute, April 12. I'm thinking here of two videos that he posted in the last week. The first of a woman kneeling on a prayer rug in the midst of the debris of a collapsed building. A mother, Abu Toha says in his notes on his post, who went out to look for food for her children and when she came back for food, a bomb had struck the neighborhood from the sky, and her three children were buried, buried under the rubble. In the video, she kneels up and down as if praying, as if attempting to contain an internal explosion, while people ran around searching for bodies. I'm not sure she was praying, she's doing it too fast. A second video showed to those who opened it, uh, the scene of devastation at the market in Gaza, Frasuk, when the second day of the eighth, just this week, a bombardment struck when people were shopping for presents. The shattered remains of a young man being carried in a blanket and a note from Abu Toha pointing us to the clothes hanged for sale, the toys, sign of life interrupted, and yet the signs that there was and there remain a will to live. In, other, in another post, immediately after, he wrote, just posted a video from today's massacre. Please witness. What are we asked, what are we asked to do by witnessing? And this is the question that Ahmed was asking. What does it mean to witness? And I will try to answer this question, and I will not be able to answer this question, because this is an impossible question to answer. In her essay, Witnessing Death in Tantura, Samara Smeir, who spoke just before us, a couple of weeks ago here, writes of the insistence of the disconnected and symptomatic memories of the survivors of the massacre perpetrated during the night 
on May 22, 1948, in the village of Tantura, in historic Palestine. During the year of conquest, or the year of catastrophe, Nakba, when the Alexandrian brigades of the not yet established state of Israel killed the majority of the village inhabitants after they had surrendered, leaving behind the few surviving witnesses. The exceptional acts of killing, as they were called in uh, the dissertation that was written about this, were unearthed by an Israeli graduate student researching for an MA at the University of Haifa in the 1990s, who interviewed the survivors, as well as the veterans of the Palestinian survivors, as well as the veterans of the Alexandroni brigades. While the survivors remembered in fragments fragments charged with affect in physical and visual ways, but were unable to produce a coherent account of the event. The perpetrator denied the killing. On the basis of the MA thesis and of the testimony provided by the graduate student himself, his name is Theodore Katz, a court of law disavowed the reality of the massacre because of the incoherence of the survivors' testimonies and the graduate student's internal doubt as to what camp that is witnessing the real. And indeed, his MA thesis was also rescinded, so his diploma was rescinded. Yet, Samira Esme reminds us in her essays, the failure to acknowledge the reality of the massacre had to do with the inability to, with the inability to open one's eyes and ears and hear the testimony of the survivors as survivors in the unfinished temporality of surviving. For as survivors, they were not external to the event, as it was required for an external evidentiary proof validated in the linear secular, in linear secular time, but they were instead connected to the dead in a space of the living permeated by the present absence of the dead. In that space, between life and death, the lacunary nature of the survivor's testimony is the very mode of bearing witness to both the dead and the event. In this sense, as Mary tells us, it is in this sense, she says, that, the year, that in the year of catastrophe, quote, the memories of the Tantura survivors stood in striking resistance to the catastrophe itself, the Nakba which caused the blurring of the living and the dead and the end of social relationships. The possibility of living was precisely located in the, instant, in the insistence of those memories that bore witness to a traumatic connection, an unrelin unrelinquished bond in the mode of survival. It was a scattering of lives into fragments they called for the utopian imagination of a common world, a world of the living, the dead, and the unborn. So what does it mean to reclaim the concept of trauma, the concept that I was saying at the beginning that it's incapable or it's inadequate to talk about such experiences? What does it mean to refroy the new? What does it mean to speak of trauma from a space of catastrophe? And in light of some psychoanalysts, or psychotherapists, or writers who have written of, of trauma in, in, in the wake of catastrophic experience, what does it mean to speak of a language of trauma, a, 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 a traumatic connection? It could be said that Freud's psychoanalysis, if we take it in a radical sense, a sense that was received by Franz Fanon and in, this, in a different way by Edward Said in his remarkable lecture, Freud and the Non European. It could be said that Freud's psychoanalysis is a call for opening our eyes to a confusing and uncertain present and to bear witness to the dead. As Frank put it in his famous essay, his thoughts for the time on war and death, um, and I just cite the first few words of that essay, in the confusion of war time in which we are caught up, relying as we must on one-sided information, standing too close 
to the great changes that have already taken place or are beginning to, and without the glimmering of the future that is being shaped, we ourselves are at a loss as to the significance of the impressions, the memory traces means, which press in upon us and to, we, and to the value of the judgment that we form. Science herself has lost her passionate impartiality. Her deeply embittered servants seek from weapons, seek weapons from her with which to contribute towards a struggle with the enemy. I will not be able to talk about this, but Freud goes on to question uh, or to think the kind of ethical insights that can be achieved from the midst of the space of confusion. And the ethical insight is about the implication of the combatant and the non-combatant into a, a relation to violence that is disavowed. And, uh, and then he goes on to reflect on what does mourning mean and, uh, and in what sense it would be possible for a veteran to come back having killed and, 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 uh, and reflect on the killing without disavowing the killing, but also without disavowing the fact of having killed. And, uh, and what would he mean from that point of view to, to encounter violence as something which is everywhere but it can be looked at with open eyes. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, you know, it talks about uh, the small achievement to give death its place in the actuality and in our thoughts, which belong to it, for instance. And he concludes his essay by saying, if you want uh, to, uh, um, uh, if, if you it, 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 end by saying that uh, uh, that it is necessary to ponder death, to to give death its due, or to witness death, or to not to bracket this question. And we have Fanon uh, on the question of the gaze and the psychic intrusion in the psychopolitical configuration of the colony as another way that is profound, that is Freud, Freud that is profoundly influenced by this Freudian insight of understanding violence. And, uh, and his reflections on the case studies from the Brida Psychiatric Hospital in Algeria on the unfinished colonial war and what he called the indelible wounds that we must, we must continue to treat the ethical, in the ethical political task of the decolonial de project of repair. He is pondering of his patient's hallucinations and traumatic delusions, witnessing, bearing witness to what he calls an apocalypse veritable, a veritable apocalypse, which suggests that unless we can actually enter the space of that veritable, veritable apocalypse, we will not be able to encounter the experience of war. Fanon went as far as saying in this incredible, uh, case studies that he wrote that are case studies of trauma in which there is no discourse on trauma, to say that the witnessing that is given in the delusional uh, testimony of the patients is the only way that we really have to have a sense of the experience of total war in a colonial war. So that actually delusion is the only access that we have to that experience. And then the last question that I have in this context is what does it mean to witness as an image? Um, when I was quoting Abu Toha, the poet who uh, writes his short poems in relation to images that he puts on the internet, and those images are images that are straight out of uh, videos that are you know, recorded on the street, and, and yet they are mediated by his words. And, uh, and in what sense, what does it mean? What is the testimony of the image? And what is uh, our responsibility to this? And I, I want to conclude on this uh, after I have one more section and then I will try to address that. My third section is called Apocalyptic Witnessing. I want to turn to witnessing Gaza in Morocco, where I, you know, where I have written about, where I spent a large part of my life. Um, through the words of a Quran scholar and a therapist with whom I've been engaged in conversation for many years, 
who is a central voice in my book, Knows of the Soul. It, I call him Dimam in my book, and I have been talking with him for over 10 years. He lives uh, in, a, in, a, in a poor neighborhood on the outskirts of the city of Sala, and not far from the psychiatric hospital where he did research, and he practices the cures of the soul, which, implied, which are the cures of madness, and, implies, and they also imply relating to spirit possession, to the spirits, and, and performing the liturgy of the Ruqiyah, uh, which is the recital of the Quran on the sides of the sick. He has, in, you know, as I wrote in my book, he stress uh, on imagination. He has a stress in, his, in, his, in the way in which he talks about his cure on the nature of imagination. Imagination as what forms the experience of a person, both in this, in this world and towards the other. The imagination as that which can close the capacity to receive the, Quran, the, the, the divine message, but the imagination is also that which can open the heart. And he talks about images um, as alienating impressions or alienating imprints that imprison and colonize the subject and the soul, and as liberating impressions, different kinds of images, disalienating, emancipatory images, images that open the heart, which instead expand the soul and make it capable to see and receive the divine interpretation. Within my I learned to approach trauma differently through the concept of the ordeal, a divine trial of the soul that becomes visible through illness, as he put it, and, as, and which is captured by the Quranic concept of ibtila, a divine testing of, or, or trial, which encodes the cardinal orientation of thinking and practice vis-a-vis -a, -vis a theological, but also the existential problem of suffering. And, uh, and in fact, when I understood the importance of this concept of the ordeal in relation to his thinking about intergenerational trauma, spirit possession, and everything, I realized that then it has to do with the kind of opening up of temporality in which another horizon was posed for the for the imagination of existence, and uh, that it was an open-ended horizon. Now in November, this last November, I went to see him when I was in Rabat for a long time, um, when the Shifa hospital in Gaza was under siege and the children were left to die in one of the war, of the war cruelest chapters. Morocco was shaken by protests against the war and against the normalization, the normalization with Israel. People gathered to watch the news from Palestine. The war broadcasted live. Many people were sick with anxiety and somatic symptoms. They were bearing witness physically in a certain way to the experience of people in Gaza, um, directly affected by the plight of Palestinians. The Imam said that the emotion of watching the war on Gaza from a distance produces a shock, and that that shock could itself break the person. Uh, there, needed to be, there needed to be a balance between emotion, as he put that, atifa, and faith, iman, akhida, or the flooding of the emotions that were triggered by the destruction of Gaza would overwhelm the soul imposed upon them. They provided, to use his world, a shield of faith to contain the overwhelming emotions of the war, the sense of ending and despair. And that not just for people in Morocco or in Gaza, because he, he saw himself as speaking also to people in Gaza, but for the therapist himself. And so I was excited. God forbid, he, he, he was talking so fast, and I, you know, he asked me to turn on my tape recorder, and, uh, and, and there it was, and, uh, and it just went, and it was a sermon. God forbids injustice, dull, and yet no Western country has stepped into stop the slaughtering of Palestinians. If we don't put an end to injustice, God will not forgive us, because God created us siblings, ahwa, as human beings. But being human is not just a given. It means to act as human, feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, care for the wounded and the ones in need. If you don't do all this, we are not human, and God will not forgive us. The world must change from this evil, 
Gaza is an example for the world. He makes visible the harm done to innocent people. And God will judge the perpetrators and most of those who seek to obliterate Palestine from the map. The truth, he continues, is now apparent. There is only one power on this planet, and it's the United States. And the brothers cannot succor each other because they are themselves conquered. They're powerless. We hate this war. The children burned and killed. The hospitals violated and destroyed. But God knows best. And looking at the destruction in Gaza from the perspective of God, he sees the neighborhoods and the ruins of Gaza visited by angels who come to succor the suffering visit the hospitals and alleviate the pain of children. The destruction of Gaza and the plight of the Palestinian people are an ordeal for him. A trial of suffering seen from the perspective of faith reveals a divine interpretation and for those who are willing to read it, the enigma of divine love. I quote him. Palestinians have endured for 75 years in the position as guardians of the sacred home at Beit Maqdisi, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, where the Prophet Muhammad started his mystical journey to the seventh sky and the divine real, and honor the counts with the highest price of this possession and forced exile. They were expelled, their, home, their homes and orchards were taken from them, their olive groves were burned, their sons were in prison, they were beaten and wounded, and now God says to the angels, they have endured, may they come to me as my guests. And the angels bring them directly to God and have a place among the blessed. God loves the people of Gaza. It brings it back to the Quranic story, story of Yusuf and the trials that Yusuf had to endure without losing his faith. And he concludes with the image of a woman giving birth that uh, stunningly sort of contrasts everything else that he has been saying um, through a near-death experience in which she is actually hoping to die because it is too painful. And then the smile, he says the smile on her face when the baby comes out, when it is born, a smile from her heart. So how to conclude this? Um, for me, Listening to the Iman was at the same time intensely moving and even shattering, and also pointed to a, a fundamental change in the way in which he has been talking about this, as if the intense abyssal horror of what he had been watching every day on TV and what has been happening to people in Gaza and what, uh, and what has been happening to people that uh, he felt profoundly for was so impossible to address from, this, this in this, from within this world that he needed a leap to the, to the beyond. A leap to the beyond that was no longer the leap which was the opening to the question of Yutila of, of the question of the ordeal as, as an interpolation, as a question, as a question for which we have no answer, but we know that God will have an answer, but there is a gap. There is something that we will not, never know of our living, but it is a question that now has been somewhat answered by an extreme pain that has requested the coming of the angels in the middle of the ruins. And, um, and so I kept wondering, and I don't know how to answer, and I kept wondering for days now, oh, what is my answer to this question? And in what sense do I want to reclaim the other meaning of the ordeal, which allows for meeting the angels in a space in which there is a possibility for life on this earth? And, um, and so to conclude, I decided to myself go to the work of poets, even some of the poets were disappeared, but to the work of poets who thought about the possibility of creation in the space of the coerced imagination, the work of the writings of Mahmoud Durish himself, 
the work of poets who thought that form itself, the capacity to shape or compress experience, has the capacity, the force of angels, as the force of uh, carving for us a space on this earth and, uh, and waiting for the beyond in the very time in which we also can witness our and others' death. Thank you. Thank you both, uh, Ahmed and Stefania, for such uh, thoughtful, deeply thoughtful, but also I think is proper ways of coming at this topic, especially in this time. I got this is an event about literature and trauma, but fundamentally both of you are, 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 are you know, bringing our attention to problematizing the, the, the you know, the crisis of the present representation, paradigms of thinking trauma, the role they really in literature to testify or kind of like the reason for testifying and what testifying does. So in a way, I do appreciate um, that both your lectures, in a way, doesn't let us do that move of, or like do, you know, do the step of thinking past or moving past. That yes, it's concluding kind of lectures, events, but nothing is concluded, nothing is conclusive. It's just, it's there, it's in the now. We mentioned when you're commenting about Ahmed's lecture, you said it's a, the refusal of the norm of hope, the refusal of just, you know, thinking the standard ways of trauma and then talking about literature and how it kind of uh, practices a type of healing that fundamentally, yes, leaves the audience with a note of hope, but then um, is incongruent with what, what's happening outside. Right? Um, so in that sense, uh, in that sense, I, I, I do appreciate. Um, the, 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 you know, the force of your, both of your lectures and the directions that they take. So I just have a couple of um, remarks, kind of questions, invitations to reflect a bit further, and then I will open uh, for questions from the audience. So just for Ahmed, uh, along the same line of the idea of, you know, the, the crisis of representation, um, um, I mean, I'm personally was touching to see your choice of you know, transcribing to us, or like relaying to us the Arabic words and story of Amina, but without translating it. And you wanted to untranslate that, and you were bringing, you know, bringing back some reflections on, on the difficulty of the narrating stories. But still, to me, like, you know, you mentioned you are an educator and you are a translator, and you mentioned that you were there in a writing workshop. So I'm just reflecting in terms of you could elaborate more on that, in that, you know, the, the, the kind of work. That literature was doing there, in that, at least in that space of the writing workshop. And maybe it's helpful to think of, like, you know, distinction between the writing act and the written. And who owns the written kind of thing? And what's the ethicality of passing down the written, bringing it and translating it to an audience, versus the writing act and what it does to the, 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 the different Palestinian children that you are working with? Um, and my second, just, I was really, you know, uh, was arresting to me to hear you talk about, and I think it's a brilliant point about uh, what you said, a sensibility, a Ghazan sensibility in terms of literature, or aesthetic, or a Ghazan aesthetic, and the fact that, as you mentioned, Gaza is, you know, as the saying goes, the, the, you know, the land of origin of oranges and short stories. And I wanted, I wanted you to reflect a little bit why the short story, in the sense that, I mean, in a way, you began to give us answers to why, because you mentioned the density, you mentioned um, and in a way, the short story is, is that, you know, it's the genre of, of a, the snapshot, of the punch, of the, 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 the immediate, it's not the genre of process, of like taking, you know, you know, a passage of time and thinking and reflection, no, it's the genre of the radical, and the radical, and, and, and or, or uh, let me say, you know, it's, it's the genre of the immediate, and Gaza is the space of the radical, 
when the radical is always immediate and it's always a cut, just like the uh, King Rome and eventually the punch. It felt like you know the knock on the soul, that intensity, that immediacy, and it's also the immediate of what is constantly happening again and again and again. So no space to reflect and start a process, right? So if you just have some reflection on that, you know, the short story there and, and its, it's uh, significance. And uh, for Stefania, um, very interesting um, take to look at the, you know, to think the psychoanalytical framework and the perception of what's happening uh, in Gaza from Morocco and in a lot of ways you and Ahmed, even though I know you have not uh, read each other's uh, presentations, you were like in dialogue already in your own lectures. And uh, to me, again, if you could just say something um, to how the standard, you know, Freudian way of coming at trauma might not be um, helpful in the context of what we are perceiving in the sense, you know, in the, uh, in the you know, Freudian scholarship on trauma and trauma studies, that yes, the experience is radical, the experience is structured through a fundamental unknowability, fundamental forgetting, um, it's singular, and that's why it comes back. While here, it's a case where trauma, I mean, there's no fundamental unmobility. Trauma is there, and it's expected, and it's coming, and it's understood. And it's not and not just because that it's war, as has been said, oh, it's war and the, you know, civilians die in war. But fundamentally, because there is that sense of an international consensus of the radical disposability of Palestinian lives, that trauma it's not just war, but war will exert a, a radical price kind of thing. So, in a way, and also the, the fact that you mentioned Shahada, and it's so interesting to think of Shahada and witnessing, but to go back to the idea, you know, the root word, the root origins of Shahada, and fundamentally that the notion of Shaheed witness, and you drew on a number of Islamic moral literature that witness, you know, the Shaheed is one of the 99 names of divine names. And then if you look up the explanation for that is that, well, the divine is the shaheed because the divine is the all known. So the divine is the witness in every case of injustice. So the witness is not the one who didn't know, actually, like in the Freudian uh, analysis, the witness and the one who experienced trauma is the one who almost has this moral responsibility of this total knowledge, what happened, what will come, um, and it's taking place. So if, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit on that. And also, finally, uh, and we still have time for the audience conversation. <laughs> so, but it's fascinating to me, too, for to think about the significance of Gaza for the Maghreb, the images of Gaza in the Maghreb. Um, and why in the Maghreb those images um, kind of evoke something of the present, something of the past, the colonial experience in the Maghreb that is very radical as opposed to other like, you know, Arab states like you know, Algeria, Serbia, colonialism, and something of futurity as well. There is some, there is this deep connection between the colonial experience of the Maghreb and Palestine uh, that I would like to hear more about from just your reflections or experience during this time uh, in the ways in which Gaza evokes that, that deep sense of the experience of coloniality in the Maghreb. Yeah, so the, those would be my two, you know, kind of my commands, questions, and feel free you know, to address them however, in whatever order you would like. Before we open. Um, the workshop, the yeah. writing, the experience yeah, the, of the workshop. The workshop, I mean, I, it, was, it was a little deliberate on my part to end on Men and the Sun. And uh, for those who know the story, uh, there is that. Uh, it's, a, it's a story written by Kenafani in uh, the early 60s. It takes place 10 years after the expulsion of 1948, so roughly 1958, according to the logic of the story. And these three Palestinian still refugees, still struggling after 10 years, uh, they decide there's an oil rush in Kuwait, and they, like many other Palestinians, decide to go to Kuwait. And the only way to get to Kuwait is by getting smuggled. Um, things go wrong, and um, they, the way uh, they get smuggled is they get uh, a smuggler to hide inside the water tank. Uh, the smuggler himself is Palestinian. Uh, and the story ends with them dying out of suffocation inside the water tank at the border crossing because 
uh, the driver takes too long. Um, but it ends on this question, why did they not knock uh, to alert other people to come to their rescue? And that's, the question remains open. Um, and I, I think one of the, the, the ways Palestinian uh, Shaddad has, has given life to uh, new forms of being Palestinian in the world, at least according to me, is that the, uh, these evacuees from Gaza, they're here, they're, they're knocking, um, and their, their knocks should be heeded, should be answered. And one of the ways it can, it can be answered is, uh, is, according to me, it's, I, I am also a, a Palestinian refugee. I, uh, I, incidentally, I'm also a victim of a violent crime. Uh, I could relate to a lot of uh, the stories that they, they bring with them. Um, and I, I thought, uh, I, I wasn't sure this would be useful at all. I would, I would get any uh, teenagers to come. Um, but uh, on the whole, it was, I think, generative and fruitful for, for everybody uh, involved. Um, and the church was to write all in physical. There was no like, you know, they, dialectical conversation. The, uh, the, that choice was, was left up to them, and I actually made a point of, of uh, asking them to write in whatever comes to their mind. They want to write in the colloquial, they want to write in the first half. Um, so they, they produced whatever they produced. Not, every, not everyone wrote. Uh, not, some people were strong out at a certain point in the discussion. They couldn't, uh, they were overcome by, by uh, certain memories. Uh, there was uh, Anas. Anas was, uh, you know, he's, he's, he smuggled his way. He's not a caretaker, a caregiver, sorry, or a, a wounded uh, person. Um, he has that slight demeanor to him. Um, but the minute we started talking as, about their uh, traumatic experiences, um, he couldn't, uh, ultimately, he shared with us. He left and came back. Uh, that he couldn't save his cousins, he could only save his brother. Um, so it was uh, it was not a, a tidy or predictable process in any way. Uh, and uh, I thought the writing would serve two, two points, two purposes. Um, would, it would be create, creating a, some kind of an informal archive. Uh, and we, because of, of the many episodes of, of dislocation and, and uh, dispossession that Palestinian history uh, has. Um, I know from my training and from my work uh, that we've had documentaries about the children of Shatila. Uh, we've had documentary work done with uh, Palestinians uh, right after uh, a massacre, right after a violent uh, episode. And, and that was a, sort of a, an inspiration for me. So I, I thought the writing would be therapeutic. That's the other side. That it would, it would, there's this theory that if you take uh, 30 minutes for four consecutive days and write down whatever comes to your mind about that traumatic experience, you slowly begin to reframe it. Um, and, and that was very ambitious on my part to think that we can, I can get them to write for four days in a row about that. So uh, um, it, I thought it, it, it would serve these two purposes, create some kind of an informal archive and, and help them deal with uh, some of these uh, traumatic uh, experiences that they, they by, by default, by the built-in shelter of them, them arriving in Doha, they all have. So in, in that way, uh, in that sense, I personally appreciate you presenting to us the written in its non-communicability as part of that writing act for those people and not just for us to kind of expand it on. It's there as part of the extension of that writing act for them versus uh, something to be more diffused and then different forms of performability as you approach to it. Yes. Absolutely. And I, and I, before coming back to, to the States, I asked them if they wanted to like, share anything with, with the audience or share anything with them, someone, anyone in America. They wrote down some uh, sentences, but they didn't want to be on camera 
um, and they, they're still very uncertain about uh, their fate, what, what will, will happen to them. Um, but in, I think in, in, in terms of writing and, and withholding translation, I think it, it's a technique used more often in cinema. Uh, and and I, I do feel that they feel very alienated, even though I am Palestinian, I sit with them and, and they were comfortable in, in a certain way, but they come from uh, uh, a very specific experience of, of being Palestinian. It's a, it's a very, uh, it's a sealed off place uh, that they come from. Um, so I felt that perhaps one of the ways I can communicate the sense of alienation they have is, is by withholding translation from the audience. Uh, um, to, I don't know to, to what degree of success that was achieved, but no, I think you know, yeah. um, these are some of the, the, the thoughts that I had in mind. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's an unfinished work. So, sure. yeah. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, well, now maybe Stefania will. Tell us something about yeah, we'll come to your questions. Um, the usefulness or uselessness or impossibilities, impossibilities of Freudian paradigms. Oh, or, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Or, or in conversation with Awad Ahmed, as just said, which is even more important. Well, let me answer, uh, well, begin to answer uh, some of your questions quickly. Um, I say uh, I you know, I'm I'm not convinced that I, that in what I try to write I, I want to um, part company so radically with psychoanalysis because I actually psychoanalysis is important for me and um, as a practice of the unconscious of that which is um, the master of the subject. And uh, of something which always exceeds the possibility of saying, or of something which uh, it's always another scene for the subject that is that is beyond, and the possibility of that beyond or allowing concepts that for us point to the possibility of that beyond uh, is fundamental. And, and in fact, it's precisely the importance of this that has led me to then uh, listen to uh, uh, dimensions of, of Quranic uh, th therapeutical practices that speak of a different beyond, but attempt to carve a space for uh, sort of a carve a space for an expansion in in, in an unknown direction. So, um, so for me, if there is a, a possible dialogue, or at least there has been for me, then there has certainly been for me in my life. And then if I have written about these things, it's because I thought that maybe this might be interesting for others, the fact that it was possible instead of simply saying, oh, these are cultural practices of different sorts, and psychoanalysis or, you know, different forms of psychotherapy. We are in the Bay Area, there are so many of them, and psychoanalysis is actually, uh, uh, to some extent, uh, obsolete, right? There's, there's something from, and that may be why it's interesting, because there is something which is almost beyond our time. Um, that, uh, uh, I think that uh, it would be then interesting to see, instead of saying these are completely different ways, thinking if, if there is a kind of some point of encounter uh, politically or existentially and politically for me it was clear that quite quickly uh, my way of understanding the practice of the unconscious went against uh, the way in which uh, um, a large majority of psychoanalysis understood the practices of the practice of the clinic particularly in and uh, in Morocco as well. So I found myself doing research in Morocco, working both in a psychiatric hospital with psychiatrists, with, with 
patients, and it was not in a side room, so people would come and go, they would be in the emergency room and stay for three weeks and then leave. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then talking with psychoanalysts who at once upon a time were in the hospital, and, uh, and in fact had a relation with that experience of alterity, which is the experience of the hospital, um, but a certain dimension of incurability even, which is the experience of the hospital, and having to live with it, that, having to sit with it, having to, uh, to sort of uh, ponder it instead of attempting to simply resolve it. Uh, so, sort of setting oneself as both a practitioner and for me as an ethnographer of those practices in a different temporality, the, in a temporality of non resolution, um, attempting to give up the desire for immediate healing or, or my desire to make change in, in someone's life, which it did happen because, uh, because it did happen in some of the stories that I, got, that I wrote about the patients. In fact, there were those moments. Uh, but uh, with the psychoanalysts, what's, you know, there's the whole question which is very much ongoing today, right, about the fact that the psychoanalysis is secular. Uh, is it even, what is the unconscious secular? Well, I would maintain that if this means anything, the unconscious is not secular. And that the, it is one of those concepts, concepts that do not fit a linear secular temporality. And then so in that would sense, lead us yeah. to think otherwise. But then they're used in certain ways, and I criticize such ways. But I also don't, don't want to give up the concept of the unconscious. I want to reclaim it. I wanted to illuminate it or be read it from a perspective that is displaced in relation to it. And it might be the perspective of pure deal. It might be the perspective of utila. So it, it is um, it, the perspective of the cures. Um, but it's you know that was about you know about which I wrote and that I uh, that I sat with for many years. Uh, but this is my um, in a way against the grain attempt to reclaim both the concept of trauma understood as catastrophe or understood that as an encounter with something bigger, so that as you were saying, you know there is a whole literature. I, you know I know you. I'm sure you're familiar, but you know, but uh, there is a book by Kathy Peruz, Listening to Trauma, that are interviews with major figures in the history of the thought about trauma, and some of them have worked on catastrophic experience. So, for instance, Robert Lipton, who wrote on Hiroshima, who wrote on the Vietnam War, who wrote on the question of the survivor, and talked about shame, and talked about um, the, the sort of the, the loss of feeling in the aftermath of the traumatic encounter or traumatic event, which is an encounter with death, who attempted to bring back the question of death to the forefront of the experience. And then, you know, there are other authors such as, you know, who have written on sexual trauma and, and, and things such as. And in my classes, when I teach about these questions, the question often emerges, uh, how can we talk about one trauma and another trauma? Even if we want to use the word um, a collective trauma of, of an immense experience as, you know, as what we were talking about, or, or you know, surviving the Vietnam War, and the fact of uh, having a different kind of trauma, a trauma that could be an accident, right? A trauma that could be, um, that could be something that is understood in our way of thinking within the sphere of private life. But then maybe trauma exceeds the sphere of private life. It really depends on how we think those things. Maybe they are more commensurable. Maybe we should think the one and the other together, but beyond the sphere of private life. Maybe there is something that exceeds and that is beyond the individual, right? That it is beyond. So that is the sense in which, and I think that for himself, um, and that's why I go to Fanon. I mean, for Fanon, it's clear that if we want to think about this question, and Fanon does not give up the concept of trauma. I mean, it's very clear. He keeps, you know, at the center of his thinking, you know, black skin, white marks, particularly, I mean, his case studies and, uh, and some, in some of his clinical studies. Also, his refusal that, but he calls the that, that he says there's not a single case of audible cure. Of course, yeah, 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 it does. Yeah. It, it, keeps the concept of trauma, but he rethinks it in terms of uh, sociological mm -hmm. 
you know, what he calls sociology is the fact that we live in a world that where there are fantasies, there are projected fantasies of the colonizer that are the air that we breathe. And then how do we traverse the air that we breathe? And yet, you know, there is something about the intrusion of those thoughts. Some of, you know, some of the writings of Fanon dreams, the dreams of the colonized in Black and White Marx, for instance, are you know, intrusive dreams that simply bring the dreamer back to the situation of, of a war, of this, you know, dreaming a gun instead of dreaming a symbol. The, the, sort of the complete impasse of symbolic things, you know. But then I think that, uh, you know, uh, so what do I stand on this? Well, I stand at some level with my students, for whom the concept is important. We were just doing an experiment in my class on this. And with the just people who use it in their life because it is politically relevant. If it is, like, it, it, in the sense in which it has been reclaimed and reappropriated in Black Studies, for instance, the concept. And um, in the work of, you know, some some important thinkers, as Orton Spiller, for instance, right, and, and the views of Nancy Thomas. And then, uh, at the same time, um, in a critical mode, which is, uh, you know, the concept of trauma is bound to the concept of the victim, uh, which is, I mean, if there was something important in what I, I mean, there are many, many things important in, in, in my encounter with the Imam when I was, including my, my honest in relation to something that was being, you know, to a transformation of this imagination. Um, but uh, there's also the fact that that imagination is, is, is deployed to undo the experience of the victim, to reject the concept of the victim, to actually produce 45 images that can undo the, the, the the sort of the internal subjugation that they can undo the, the the temptation of despair, but also the instrument instrumentalization of the work of the NGOs, also the whole you know the the, the workshops on trauma and uh, and thinking smart about the healing and um, and in what sense does it mean does that make sense I think uh, at this moment to radicalize thinking of trauma and saying, well, no, that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about something very different. I want to keep calling it trauma because I actually think that uh, maybe I will change my mind. Maybe I will abandon it. I read in my book, I call it some, something, you know, I try to invent words for it, but... Um, but well, I personally think you make very successful use of trauma into the ordeal and bringing it into the, you know, the conversation with the Islamic theories how to make it sensible, traumatic. So in a way that your, your lecture itself does that work. But I do think, because you were telling me, uh, you know, Freud, uh, I actually think I, I talked about uh, thought for the time of war and death, because that is, you know, a, a very uncanny text of Freud, you know, which is actually undoing the logic of Western liberalism in the context of the First World War, and, and, uh, and sort of basically calling each of us to the, to, to, to come to, to term with the question of violence in a different way and then to take responsibility for one's own violence and, uh, um, as well and the projection of this violence. That is a text that in the context of what's happening today in Gaza is important to reread. Um, but also, you know, some of Freud's texts about trauma, particularly his late texts about trauma, um, was the bringing to the core of the concept of the death drive as an enigma, which is not a, a, an individual enigma, but it's an enigma that concerns life forms even, and not just uh, and not just um, not just even human collectivities. I think uh, there is uh, there is matter to think there. So, um, so the second question that uh, I think okay. I guess we only have like ten minutes for Q and A. So okay, so let's go to Q and A. It was about the, you know, the, what Gaza represents about the coloniality in general in the mother, but maybe like we can come back to it in the Q and A. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I, I'm no, no, it's, it's very wonderful stuff. So I'll just open the floor for any questions from the audience. Yes. 
Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. I'm going to close the story. Yeah, Jake's here. Um, um, I guess like the, what your lecture reminded me of is something that I read in my rhetoric class last semester. It was uh, Sophocles's, uh, sorry, Sophocles's Philoctetes. Um, it, it talks about trauma and pain as well, but it also shows uh, the expression of trauma in the form of rhetoric and how making other people empathize with their pain is um, it's something that has to be done effectively for other people to truly, be, um, truly believe what you're saying. And we see this with the Gazans every day as well, with how they're, how even though their suffering is clearly visible as is with Philippines, um, they still need to find the correct words to say to make the Western world or anyone believe what they're feeling. So my question is, uh, is what happens to your trauma when you need to use it to make other people believe it, to frame your pain to make it more easily understandable to others? Um, it is a very important question. I, I, I sense with, the, with this uh, assault on, on Palestinian life, uh, I sense amongst colleagues and, and people in solidarity with, with me as a Palestinian or with people in Gaza as Palestinians under, under, undergoing uh, genocide, uh, a move in the opposite direction, a move away from trying to find every possible way to express your trauma in an intelligible way to the West. Uh, I, I think there, there is a, a, a fault line that is, is becoming visible between uh, the global South and, and the West in ways that we haven't seen in a, in a really long time or perhaps uh, never before. And you see that with South Africa and Ireland uh, as, as political entities and, and, uh, and how they acted vis-a-vis -vis Palestine, vis-a-vis -vis Gaza. Um, I don't think that so so. Uh, I don't think that was the result of uh, framing Palestinian suffering in a in a certain way as much as uh, an intersection of experience of colonial experience in these three places, Palestine, Ireland, and South Africa. And that's something that's happening, I think, on a, in a scale that we haven't seen before. Rather than, uh, you know, cultural affinity with neighboring Arabs, for example, you have a different type of affinity that's shaping solidarity, work around solidarity. And that's based on shared uh, historical experience. Uh, more, more than geographic proximity to uh, the location of, of uh, the atrocities. Um, I don't know why that is. I don't know why, why Palestinians are, are reluctant uh, to uh, uh, expend extra effort to uh, present themselves as humans. Uh, because I think, in, in essence, this is, this is what the premise of, of this demand uh, requ requires and requests. Uh, I think Palestinians realize that they are fully human and, and uh, the recognition of their humanity falls fully and squarely um, on the beholder uh, of their condition. Um, and that's why I left the, the I mean, as words in Arabic, I'm dressing. Very much agree with what Ahmed said. And uh, I think that uh, this is a tricky, like it's, um, the title of my, my talk was Open Your Eyes, because actually uh, posing oneself as the subject wanting to be recognized in one's suffering um, is, a, is a way of closing one's eyes. And, um, and, and, so, and so there is, a, in a certain sense, a refusal 
to use the, the figure of recognition. And uh, in, in the way in which we, both of us, and you know, we have been talking about trauma, we have been using the word, but we have not been using it in that sense. And, and that's why uh, Rajdi is asking us whether we should drop the word. But, uh, but. Uh, okay. As you already did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so the question uh, for me, for instance, when I, I didn't talk so much uh, in, in my lecture about this because, because it was just hard for me to write it this way, uh, but uh, there was a fundamental question that I was trying to address that I didn't foreground, which is the question of the basic image in this. The, the question of what, what is the witnessing? So when I was saying, please witness, what does it mean? What does it mean to please witness? Please witness with an image. Would that image be a, a, a testimony that is actually uh, allow for the legal recognition of the happening, as in the case of Cantura I was talking about, where the recognition fails, because actually the happening is something that eludes that logic, right? To recognize the massacre of Cantura would mean to be able to listen to the dead. The dead are not listened to in that mode, and therefore the massacre in that mode cannot be recognized. So what other different politics can we think about in that context? And uh, and the, the question of the images when you know I have been working with uh, with, uh, with 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 friends from uh, um, an anonymous uh, documentary film collective from Syria uh, that has been filming for uh, Abu Nadara, yes, uh, that has been filming uh, for uh, you know between uh, 2010 and. 2017, during the, before the revolution, during the revolution, until the civil war, attempting not to film in the mode of recognition of uh, uh, a traumatic condition that can be translated to the West as something that then becomes the basis for a claim, an identity claim that would increase the violence or a claim about the, the pleasure that is extracted from, from the, the spectacle of, of others suffering. And, um, and, and, and the constraints to what does it mean to use an image that, may, that, that will not do that. I would call it you know, a desalinating image, an image that does not imprison, but an image that eludes the possibility of fixing it and, uh, and allow for the expression of a humanity that does, not, that does not ask to be recognized as human, and yet it addresses us as human, uh, as to do with requirements of form, as to do with the poetics of the image, for, as to do with the practice of montage, as to do with not simply thinking that reality is transparent and we can just take pictures and share them on the internet because that is what gives the truth to the event. The truth to the event is more complicated, in fact, uh, um, to be able to produce an image that uh, is capable to convey an experience, it may be much harder than it seems. Thank you. I think we have uh, time for one last question. Yes. Uh, Ahmed, I wanted you to explain, you said they no longer search or at least find some of your answers in academia. And I wanted to expand on that, considering that there's only one president of a university that said something about the destruction of Gaza's universities. And how does that, especially in this current period, academic world, you're concerned about everything, but insisting on literally almost erasing Palestine within an academic setting? Um, thank you. You, you, you know probably more than anybody in the room how, how hard it is to be a, a Palestinian in, the, in an American university. It has never been easy to be a Palestinian in any role uh, in, a Palest in an American university. Um, we have, we're, we're, whatever achievements, whatever accomplishments uh, we have that allows us to have this marginal space uh, has been uh, fought really hard for, for decades. Um, it's still, uh, uh, we're still on the very, very fringe, very far fringe margin uh, of American university campus 
life in so many ways. Uh, I I think I'm not alone in, in being uh, in expressing in expressing disillusionment uh, and the promise of, of uh, that utopian uh, campus life in America. Um, as you, 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 you said, the universities in Gaza are all destroyed. Uh, hardly anybody has, has uh, uttered a word uh, of condemnation, of uh, solidarity, of sympathy. Um, we are not seen as uh, fully uh, equal, as, as peers, as uh, even credible, uh, whether as, as scholars or many of us uh, as citizens. Uh, and uh, if you're if you travel the world, and those of us who travel the world realize how outside of certain places in the U.S., uh, America, planet America, is is uh, very inward looking, very self obsessed, very self uh, uh, absorbed, and. To me, the academic life is, is the antithesis uh, to this kind of uh, condition. And uh, in my own experience, I haven't found anywhere outside of you know, certain pockets of Manhattan that transcends this uh, inward-looking American way of uh, uh, analyzing things. Um, even our very, like the terms that we use, decolonial this and decolonial that, the minute you leave the American Academy, you discover uh, uh, treasure, a world of, of other ways of, of decolonizing the mind, of uh, talking about the same problems that we try to engage with. So I, I am finding my answers elsewhere, and I'm seeking my answers elsewhere, because it is uh, uh, liberating in more meaningful ways. Um, and it doesn't imprison you in, in um, Intellectually or, or physically, uh, the way uh, being a Palestinian academic in an American university was uh, these days. Thank you. Um, and on that note, please you know, join me in thanking our speakers for today. Well, thank you. And uh, on behalf of my other colleagues from MELC uh, who organized this series, I want to thank again our speakers, discussants, the audience. And when we start this series in February, where well, we didn't imagine that we would be where we are right now, where we think that the need uh, to speak about Palestine is even bigger than before. So please check uh, um, our events. Uh, from uh, Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures Department. There will be uh, more uh, talks, more workshops, teachings about Palestine. Thank you.